Have you ever been working with someone else or maybe a couple other people on something, a homework assignment? Maybe you're working with others in your organization and at a certain point you get frustrated because it's hard and you say, it would be so much easier if I just did it myself. And so you try to do it yourself, probably, because working with other people is hard. And sometimes it does feel easier and faster and more effective to just get it done on our own. But here's the thing, problems, generally don't get fixed that way. If a problem impacts more than you, then more than you has to be involved in solving that problem. And here's the other thing I've learned in life. Nothing worth doing can be accomplished by a single person acting alone. Nothing worth doing can be accomplished by a single person acting alone. It's true for all of us. Think about any achievement you're proud of. There were other people involved. And so, Learning how to collaborate effectively with others is critically important to problem solving. You cannot be a leader unless you collaborate with others. Even though sometimes, maybe all the time, it's difficult and messy and sometimes frustrating. So how do you learn to collaborate effectively? There are two things that are vital to collaboration, which is vital to problem solving, and therefore, two qualities that all leaders must have. Humility and empathy. Humility. What is that? Humility doesn't mean false modesty. It doesn't mean hiding your light under a bushel. It doesn't mean saying, oh, no, not me, I can't do that. But humility is understanding that you can't do it all by yourself. Humility is knowing you don't know it all. Humility is understanding that maybe you need other people. Humility is understanding that you're not perfect, that you don't get it right all the time, that you don't have all the answers. And unless you are humble, then you're never going to be able to hear anyone else with whom you are collaborating. If you think you know it all, then why should you pay any attention to anybody else? Leaders are humble. And sometimes that sounds counterintuitive because if we think of a leader as someone with a big title or a big position, a lot of times those people aren't very humble. They got big egos to go along with their big titles. Then they're not a leader, despite their title. Humility is required for effective collaboration. So is empathy. I think we lack a lot of empathy today. I think in our culture today, we judge so quickly. We judge so harshly. And I think sometimes our technology makes that all worse because we get on our devices and we see somebody who's not in our tribe or not in our pack or doesn't agree with us and we judge them. That's not empathy. Empathy is the ability to actually see and hear someone else, to see past their circumstances, to see past their appearance, to see past, perhaps, their political affiliation, their religion, the team they're on, to see past all that and to be able to actually see a person who has something to contribute, who is where they are for a reason. Empathy is the ability to see and hear someone else. And when you combine the humility that understands, yes, I have much to contribute, but others have much to contribute as well, with the empathy that allows you to actually hear and see someone else's contribution, now you're on your way to effective collaboration. So now you have a problem. You've identified the problem. You are on your way to effectively collaborating with others who agree with you that it is a problem. Let us presume that you have spent the time together assessing your current state with clear-eyed realism and thinking about your future state with optimism and imagination. Now what? Well, I've learned in my life and in my experience that once again, to actually make progress from the current state to the future state, you have to have a systematic, disciplined 
approach. And I've also learned that the more complicated the problem is that you're taking on, the more likely it is that you might forget something along the way. And so I devised a tool a long time ago that would help me maintain discipline, that would keep me on the path from current state to future state, and that wouldn't let me forget anything. Because sometimes we could get overwhelmed by the complexity of the problem in front of us. Or sometimes, when we get overwhelmed, we just go back to what we know well. I'll pause and tell you a very brief story, an analogy, if you will. I don't know if you know much about Spanish bullfighting, but in um, bullfighting, there is a term called carencia. The carencia is a spot in the ring that every bull stakes out in the fight. Every bull has a particular carencia, a particular spot in the ring to which they will return. And it is, among other things, the matador and the toreador's job to figure out what is that carencia, where is that spot. The bull, as the fight ensues, as the bull feels more and more threatened, he retreats more and more often to his carencia. And while he retreats to his spot where he feels safe, in fact, he is becoming more and more vulnerable because he's more and more predictable. People have carencias also. We all have places that we retreat to, habits that we rely upon, people we go rushing back to. We go back into our comfort zone, we might call it. And that's the other reason why I developed the leadership framework. The leadership framework helps me, and I think it will help you, take a systematic, disciplined approach. The leadership framework, I think, helps ensure that we don't forget anything along the way, particularly when we're overwhelmed by something that seems complicated and a little tougher than we thought it might be when we tackled it in the first place. And the leadership framework also helps me, and I think it will help you not fall into the trap of just doing the things I'm best at. Sometimes we want to do over and over again the things we're good at, and we leave off the things that we need to do. In an organization, that carencia, by the way, is frequently reorganizing. How many times in any organization, a school, a business, have you seen people reorganize, like all the time? And the reason people reorganize so often is not necessarily because it's the best solution to the problem. It's because they know how to do that. Organizations know how to say, you're the boss, and here's the line of command. Everybody knows how to do that. It's comfortable. But it may not solve the problem. So the leadership framework. I call it a framework because literally it's shaped like a frame, like a picture frame, four sides. At the very top of that leadership framework, we start with goals. What are our goals? What are we trying to achieve? What's the future state we're going for? And once again, you're not surprised to hear me say, we write it down. We write it down so that we all agree on it. How often have you sat down with a group of colleagues to solve a problem or make progress on something, and halfway through you realize we don't agree on where we're going? That happens all the time. People have different views in their heads of what are our goals, what's our future state. So get clear, get crystal clear. What is our future state? What are our goals? What are we trying to achieve? We always start with where we're trying to go. On another side of the frame, what in an organizational setting you would call structure and process, what in a personal context you would say, who's going to do what? Who's going to do what? Whether your team is a small group of colleagues and friends and you're focused on a problem right in front of you or you're in an organization, the point is there has to be some clarity about who is going to do what in order to achieve goals. Have you ever watched little kids play soccer? If you've ever watched little kids play soccer, you know that what happens when they're starting to learn the game is they all swarm the ball. Nobody understands the concept of playing your position. So the ball starts to move, and 
all these kids go run after the ball. Well, in a way, thinking about structure and process, who's going to do what, is trying to figure out what's my position. What is my role? What am I going to contribute? That's different from, but complementary to, what someone else is going to do. The bottom of the framework, metrics and results. Again, it's a step we so often forget when we're problem solving, but think about it. We measure everything these days. We measure our heart rate at rest and walking up the stairs. We measure how many hours of sleep, how many steps we take, how many calories, we measure everything. And yet, so often, people will start down the path of solving a problem and they never think about how are we going to measure success? What are the results we're actually going to achieve? And so it's worth thinking about right at the beginning. What would success look like? How would we measure it? and get that down, and get agreement about that as well. And then the final side of the framework, behavior. Culture, we might call it, in an organization. How are we going to operate together? Culture is kind of a big word, a big abstract word, but if you think about it, if you break it down, what culture is really, is what's it like around here? What's it like? How do people interact with one another? How do people behave? What's expected of people? Are people behaving in a way that's humble and empathetic and collaborative? Is that what we need more of to solve a problem? The answer is always yes. Or do we hold up individual stars? Well, that behavior may not be conducive to problem solving. Do we want a culture, an environment of accountability where we actually know because of how we're measuring our results, whether some person on the team is accountable for and delivering what they are supposed to. Are they playing their position or are they running off on the sidelines and having a snack? Behavior, culture, is what I would call the software of a team. The goals, who's doing what, how you measure success, I would call that hardware. And just like with the device we all use every day, there's hardware and there's software. The hardware and the software have to work together. And so we need to be aligned on our goals. What are we trying to achieve? We need to be clear about who's doing what. We need to be aligned and clear as well about how are we going to measure our success, what are the results we're trying to achieve, and then to make all of that happen, we need to have behavior, interactions one with another that support the achievement of those results, the software. Sometimes in organizations, you'll go into an organization and you'll hear people talking about culture is the soft stuff. I say it's the software. And making sure that people are behaving one with another in a way that supports the achievement of the goals, that's sometimes the toughest stuff of all. The leadership framework. It's a relatively simple tool, but it's a tool that ensures that we take a disciplined, systematic approach, that we don't get overwhelmed by the complexity of what's in front of us that we don't forget anything, that we don't run to our carencia, to our comfort zone, and do the same things over and over again instead of all the things that are required. <laughs>